Hi everyone, welcome back. I want to talk to you about Monaco. Uh, this plane is covered with Monaco. This is just going to be a little short thing. Uh, everywhere you look on the internet, you can find uh, guys showing you how to Monaco. They show you how to make the base, put the base color on, colors over top, striping, pinstripes, all that kind of stuff, and even things like this, because that's all Monaco. But one thing they don't talk about is the effects of humidity. One thing that I found out over the years living overseas on a tropical island where the, the humidity range between 75 and 90% on a sunny day is that you can cover, build an airplane and cover it over there and it will stay nice and tight all the time until you move back to a place like Michigan where the humidity is lower and you go out on a hot day that's 50-60% um, humidity and all of a sudden you have an airplane that's wrinkled and when you try to get the wrinkles out you can't because it's so wrinkled that you can't get it all out and what happens is if you're in like East Coast uh, high, humid, high humidity uh, Florida all the way down to Florida Georgia places like that where you have humidity and sometimes here in Michigan it can get 60 65 percent is that the balsa wood will expand okay when balsa wood loves moisture it'll suck it in like a sponge and it'll puff up like a sponge when it gets wet and when you cover like that it looks great until you go to the center of the states where the humidity drops and all of a sudden your plane looks like the face of an old witch on a horror movie it's just <laughs> nasty uh, so there's something to consider is when you cover your models with Monaco do it in a place where the humidity is low where you have a dehumidifier and you can drop the humidity in your in the room that you're doing it in um, I recommend 50% or lower um, down here in my basement in the winter time is when I usually cover, if I use Monaco, the, the humidity will actually drop down to about 35%. It gets so dry down here because the furnace is here and it's blowing hot air and the dehumidifier is running. And usually it don't even run because the humidity is so low and I have it set for 35%, just so my planes don't expand and contract. That's something to consider. Uh, this plane was done in, uh, I think it was covered in the winter time. It was very dry. And as before I lived here and I had a basement up, upstairs at our house and, and still it wrinkles a little bit. So it doesn't get rid of all the problems, but the majority of your problems will be from humidity. Something to think about when you cover a plane with Monaco. Uh, people in the southwest don't realize it when I lived in New Mexico my planes were some of them were covered in Monaco and they were nice and tight my move back to Michigan higher humidity place it uh, never wrinkled never ever and a matter of fact the Monaco Monaco got so tight that I was afraid if I tapped it too hard it was gonna break I mean it was that tight drum tight so uh, Take that in consideration next time you decide to put on Monaco and uh, if you decide to travel too if you're on the East Coast and you're gonna travel like say you got a beautiful war bird but you were in a hurry and covered with Monaco and you, or a biplane or something and you go to let's say warbirds over the Rockies be prepared to have something to shrink your covering material because I guarantee you when you get out into the Rockies and I've lived in I lived in Denver uh, it will sag and bag on you no doubt about it and if you don't get that experience that's great but nine times out of ten you'll have that problem just wanted to throw that out there and some of you to ponder on think about and uh, next time you cover a model give it a shot see if it makes a difference for you because a lot of these arfs that come from uh, Asia some of them don't have air conditioning when they cover their models with uh, some kind of a 
a plastic film and I've seen it on some of these thousand dollar birds that these guys are bringing out to the field and uh, our humidity here in Michigan is lower than what it is in Asia by far because I've been all over the place over there I've been in Korea I've been in the Philippines I've been in on Japan but a lot of these factories they don't have air conditioning some do some don't and if you have one that don't or if they don't get the humidity low enough in their building by the time it sh ships and gets to the US it's wrinkled I'm sure you guys bought ours that are wrinkled and that's the reason why at least in my opinion a lot of guys will debate me on that but that's okay because I've learned and found out the hard way humidity has a lot to do with it besides your technique I'm not talking about your technique and how well you can put it on or how tight you can pull it you know don't worry about that I'm talking about your airplane contracting and expanding with the humidity so there you go I'm gonna put this away we'll get started on the wing fairing on the Cougar there's a fuse and over there's the wing so uh, I'll bring them together right here and we'll get started actually fiberglassing painting as hard as a brick bat for a leading edge welcome to Sig Cougar build part 8 formers uh, I know it's gonna be a little out of turn there it is I got it on one of my stands I finally cleaned it off a little bit but uh, I want to show you stand up here and show you is this edge of the fairing right here on the wing a lot of guys would be happy with this but I'm going to show you how to make it better and uh, I'll zoom in and you can see what I got you can see the edge of the fairing really well and this lip is sanded flat it don't look flat but it is one sixteenth of an inch that's a sixteenth of an inch right there and it's kind of beveled inward kind of like this on an angle like that just a little bit so what I'm going to do is lay some masking tape down on this edge right on the edge of the aileron and bring it all the way up real kind of close where this line is I don't know if you can see uh, there, the line is gone back there but it'll be about an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch out from uh, the fairing and then in, inside here this quarter of an inch or eighth of an inch at whatever I decided when I get to it I'm going to uh, pack in some more polyester resin but before I do that I have to put in some kind of a mold release for release agent I plan on using part all number 10 this comes from US composites uh, I gave you the web address before, but I'll give it to you again. It's uscomposites.com, U-S-C-O-M-P-O-S-I-T-E-S.com. And they're out of West Palm Beach, Florida. And this is where I always get my part all from. They say to spray it using, let's see, was it 80 to 90 PSI? And I'm not going to do that. Uh, Cause it's going to make a mess i mean blowing it on this big on a big plane is different you got a lot more area to do but this is really small so it's, it's not worth the time and the mess so i'm going to use a brush and that'll be just on the fuselage itself not on the wing just on the fuselage i'm going to spray the fairing and underneath the fairing on both sides uh, i'm not going to get any on the wing at all So when I sand it out, I'll just sand the edge of it, make it flush with the wing, flush with the fairing. And when you pop that all off and clean it up and put the wing back down you, and get the paint on it, you, you might not even be able to see where that wing is sitting onto the, onto the fuselage or the fuselage sitting on the wing. It's going to be that tight. So uh, let me take the wing off and I'll start applying this part all and you can basically see how it's done it, it's pretty simple it's it's a no-brainer so I'm gonna show it anyways <laughs> give me a second I'll be right back I don't believe I explained the what I'm gonna do very well so I'm gonna kinda go over it on the whiteboard let's say this is a fuselage 
Okay. Contour the top. <laughs> Fuselage side and the fairing. Okay. Now where I'm going to apply part all is all around this area here from here all the way down and especially here and underneath. Okay. That's going to be on both sides the full length of the fairing and then I'll attach my wing to the fuselage wing half all right now what I'll do is I'm going to put a piece of masking tape the whole quarter of the wing from the front to the back right here and then I'll mix up some micro balloons with some uh, polyester resin board wants to fall still wants to fall and what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill this in from here to here right there with micro balloons and polyester resin and then I will sand this flush all of this will be flush with the tape and the fairing on the side of the fuselage and once it's down to the tape I'll remove the tape and it's going to leave a little bit of a line and I'll sand that flush to the wing when that's done. Hope that explains it a little better. Okay, I'm gonna put the part all on and we'll get to it. Well, I put the part all on with the brush. You can see the, the color differential right here. It goes on real easy. Um, you just gotta make sure you spread it out real thin and uh, I forgot to mention that it, it just comes off the water so once you're done you just wipe it with a rag really well wash it down and it comes off it's not a big deal what I need to do is put down my masking tape it's just good old-fashioned masking tape I'm gonna reach in front of you and lay it down right on the edge of the aileron and I'm going to bring it in as I go Uh, it's not cooperating and kind of pull it in like that I'll tip it up on its side so you can, you can take a look there you can see the masking tape and it's about an eighth of an inch sloping down to hardly anything in the front and a quarter inch towards the back. Got my resin and micro balloons all mixed up here. You can see the consistency is not too awfully thin but not too thick. Using my frosting spreader for putting this on. I'm going to lay it right down in there <clears throat> just like this. Packing it in the best I can. It's going to be a little bit more bulk to it. I'm just get pressing it in right now. Even though it looks good. I'm going to put a little bit uh, more on there so it goes over the edges. More like that where I can't see the seam myself. I made a mix up enough for uh, both sides so when I'm done with this side I'll cut away and do the other side. Almost done here. Pack some up front.
Might have to use a different spreader here. Can't quite get up in there. Something like that. There we go. A little bit underneath. Get rid of some of this excess. So the more I take off now, the easier it is going to be to sand out. Well, took a little more off than I wanted here. A little patch job. Okay, something like that. Now I'm going to go to the other side and do that real quick. Be right back. You guys remember that? Rolled up piece of 80 grit. That's to get down into this fairing. And this has been dried for 24 hours now, so. And uh, you just start whacking away at it. Taking it down. You'll stop when you grind down to the edge of the tape. And you just keep going at it and going at it. And you've seen me do fairings before up here and stuff, and it's no different, it's just bigger. Try not to dig into your tape too much. And the closer you get to your objective, the better you can see the lines. I don't know if you can see that. See my downward line right there? It's, it's barely visible. Visible. Maybe if I pull it closer. But anyways, that, that's my guide, basically. I have to re-roll my sandpaper. I like starting where I can kind of see where it's at so I can just get in here and just start whacking away and find the edge then the rest of it I can follow suit and I can see the line where the fairing touches the, the secondary fairing let's see if you can see that can you yeah you can barely see it let me point it out uh, right here see that it's kind of a lighter color that tells me I'm right where I want to be and that has to go all the way up to the front and all the way to the back wish I could get a better angle on it with some light oh there you can see it right up in here it's at the edge of the tape and there's the the edge where the fairing is on the fuselage. Every time you set your sandpaper down, it unrolls on you, so you got to re-roll it. It's kind of a hassle. You can glue it, uh, a piece of 80 grit onto a wooden dowel and do the same thing. But I found that the sandpaper wears out so quickly that you're constantly redoing your sandpaper. But this is all you do. I'm going to keep on whacking on this. And so I don't bore you to death, I'm going to break away and finish this up. And in the blink of an eye, I'll be back. It's completed, as you can see. If you look real close, you can see the part I added to the wing. And this is the part on the fuselage where this black line is. And if you listen real close, I'll see if I can get close with the microphone. You can't hear the, you can't even hear where the crack is. But there is one there. 
you can see that I'm looking at the monitor here um, let's see right about in here you can see the light color that's on the wing and the darker color is on the fuselage and that's where I sanded it to so I could see the transition line all the way up and around and uh, I'm to the point where I believe I need to pop this apart and see what I have so let me flip this over and take the screws out of the wing and pop it apart usually I wouldn't show the taking out of the screws of the wing but I want you to hear the forces that are released the tension when these screws come out if it makes any noise a lot of times it does sometimes it don't you hear that I'll screw it back down you'll hear maybe not there it goes that cracking and snapping a lot of tension but that's the way it usually goes when you put the filler on the wing because there's always some tension there okay I'm gonna cut away I'm gonna flip this thing over or get it so it stays upright and uh, we'll pop it off this old uh, cradle that it's sitting on is not the best in the world because every time I touch the plane it wants to rock one way or the other so just like before when we put the fillet on the on the fuselage against the wing gotta wrap it off of there so here we go and off it comes that is what we're left with that little bead on the wing now when you put this back on to paint your plane and prime it a few times whatever little gap there is will be gone I put the wing back on the fuselage just to show you the seam since I really didn't show that too well and you can see it right here the line comes up you can see where my vertical lines end the part all has been washed off looks like I didn't quite get it all in one spot here but anyway you can hear how smooth it is if there was a ridge there you'd hear it with this it'd go you would hear a little tick but there isn't one so when I get ready to paint every time I put a layer of primer or color on I crack the wing off just to keep this separation nice and clean but I really wanted to sh for you to see and to hear how nice that, that transition is all the way down to the surface of your wing so you don't get that little bump at the edge of your your wing fillet you get this nice smooth transition very easy to paint and it looks really nice when you're done it's just a little detail thing that helps your model get that little bit of an edge over your buddies when you're at the field okay let's get on with it well there it is guys that's that's how I do a wing fillet um, I think we need to move on to something else and uh, usually when I get to this point I'm ready to prime but in this case I left a lot out I gotta go inside the fuselage yet I need to install the tank I need to put the aileron servo on the wing and that is just about it as far as the internal parts go just the tank and the servo uh, I'm trying to think of other things I got to do yet one of the things that's going to be interesting is the cowling um, a lot of guys have problems with their cowling they're not sure how to do it so they just kind of do the hit and miss with the drill punching holes in their cowling and drumming it out and hoping for the best but I got a little bit better way that I've developed over the years so uh, I will show that probably not on this video maybe the next video because this one is uh, going to be more involved with what's left like the tank and the aileron servo so let me get things set up I'm a little bit slow today uh, <laughs> it's, it's been a, a pretty bad weekend for me so but I will to get myself on track here and 
and get rolling on this other stuff. So I think what would be important to do next is the fuel tank. Uh, that's the furthest up in the fuselage. I don't think there's anything else I need. Uh, let's see, rudder servos in, elevator servos in, retract servo. I'll, I still have to deal with switches and batteries and things, but that that's gonna be all part of the center of gravity on, on where the battery just is going, going to go. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna have to add weight to the tail, of course, because that 60 is a, a heavy motor. And more than likely what I will do if I have to add weight is I'll put it in up here, or down here. It's the bottom of the fuselage. I'll just get stick weights and put them on the inside as far as I can and get it real close till it's just a little bit nose heavy and then on top of that I'll get some epoxy and I'll just dump some epoxy on top of the lead. I don't like doing that. I could cut a hash back here and put the battery further back but that's a hassle. The 60 has plenty of power to pull this around even with lead weight in the tail and it's not going to affect the flying of it all that much. So that's what that's going to be about and I know, I know a lot of you guys are going ooh you're going to put weight in the tail but a lot of times it can't be helped uh, in this case it could be but I'm not going to because it's just I don't know it's a sport plane <laughs> what can I say so uh, let me grab the gas tanks the fuel tanks and uh, show you what I'm going to do with that since there's not a lot of room in here it's going to be kind of kind of interesting for somebody who hasn't set up a tank like this before so Give me a second, I'll be back. I'm somewhat prepared to install a tank, but I want to talk about fuel tanks a little bit more and how it's going to go into this Cougar. And you can see I don't have a whole lot of room to fit a tank in there. Since I have a platform in here for the retract, it's going to restrict the size of the tank I can use. And with the 60, I would use a 12 ounce or bigger. Well, a 12 ounce is not going to fit in here. I have uh, cables for the retract steering and the retraction part of the retract gear the cable <clears throat> and that's all in the way a 10 ounce would be nice that would give me how oh, probably seven minutes or so of flying but maybe longer but uh, it's not gonna fit so the question is what to do the only way I could make it work is to go smaller. And what I decided was to go with a six ounce tank. I'd go with an eight, but I don't have a, an eight ounce. And that will go over the center of gravity. And up front will be a four ounce tank protruding out the firewall. Since I was going to cover up the hole in the front, I told you I was going to fill in that hole. But I found this four ounce will slide right up in there. And this will give me 10 ounces, the six and the four. If I had an eight, that'd give me 12 and that'd be even better, but I don't have one. So I'm just gonna go with these two and these are brand new. And how I'm gonna do it, uh, I'll bring out the whiteboard and I will give you a, a brief description on how I'm gonna do this. Be right back. I'm not the best artist in the world, so you have to bear with the drawing, but I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna set these tanks up to make everything work and um, the tanks are set up in the normal way and this is the rubber stopper that looks like this okay screw in the middle and I always go when you're looking at it like this the pressure always goes to the muffler side and and the other side goes to the carb the pressure line comes in up here and it pressurizes the tank. You set up it, set it up in the normal way. Pressurizes the tank, the main tank, the six ounce. And that will force the fuel from the pickup into the overflow of the smaller tank and will come out to the carb. And to fill it, you just go in reverse order, pump it into the carb. The overflow will fill the main tank and this overflow will tell you when everything's full. And that's how it's going to be done. 
uh, they'll set pretty much in line. This is broke up like this just for the purpose of being able to uh, see it better. But like I said, I'm using a four ounce tank for the main for the header tank, which is next to the engine or behind the firewall. And the six ounce tank will be over the center of gravity. And another reason this is a nice setup is that you have less weight when the end when the plane is full of fuel, you have less weight in the nose. I don't know if you've ever noticed that in a plane set up conventional way with nitro motor. You fill up the tank and you check the center of gravity, it's going to go like this. I mean, it's not going to stay nice and balanced. It's going to be nose heavy by a tremendous amount. And normally I would take a larger tank and set it over top of the center of gravity. And that would eliminate that problem completely, kind of like on a full scale. All of the fuel tanks are normally in the wings over the center of gravity, so it doesn't change the center of gravity when you get low on fuel. Well, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that uh, that much fuel is designed into the plane like that and it's not going to hurt the way it flies. Well, maybe for an average sport flyer, um, but back in the day, in the 70s, early 70s, I used to fly pattern quite heavily. Flew contests uh, and I found that as a fuel dissipates in the nose the weight starts to drop and you get closer to the center of gravity to that nice even flying ability but by the time you get there the fuel is gone your plane is out of gas and that's the only time you get a neutral flight with your trim and uh, my main plane that I flew a lot of contests with is Dirty Birdie and I had a, a 12 ounce tank in the nose and when I filled it up and checked the center of gravity, that sucker was almost 90 degrees straight up and down. So I decided that wasn't any good. So I moved the tank back to the center of gravity and checked it with a full tank until my center of gravity was perfect. And all during the flight, my trims never really changed because as your fuel goes and your trim for fuel for having fuel in your tank at a full tank, you have to carry a little bit of up elevator just to maintain that level flight. And when your fuel dissipates, then all of a sudden your plane wants to climb a little bit. And to, do, to get rid of all of that, I moved the tank to the center of gravity. And actually I went to a smaller tank because when you fly pattern, you're only up there a couple minutes. So you don't need all that fuel. So I went from 16 and 12 ounce tanks down to 6 ounce tanks and flew my routine that way. And uh, the plane was a little lighter. I didn't mess up my center of gravity. And uh, after I was done flying pattern, because that got old pretty fast. Well, it took me 10 years to get over it. <laughs> but I started flying uh, shows. And doing maneuvers, even with a sport plane, I found was a little weird because of the, the fuel and nose. So I went back and put, it, put the tank in the center of gravity and got rid of all the bad characteristics. Uh, one of the things I used to do in the 70s uh, with Cougars is I would put very little fuel in, enough to get about five, six minutes in, in the flight, and I'd intentionally run out of fuel. Motor would go dead. And uh, I would do a little short aerobatic routine with uh, on a dead stick and come in and land and that was just a routine that I dreamed up and uh, I did that for many years. I still do it every once in a while, but not as often because I haven't had a good sport plane to fly in a while and I don't do that with a, a scale model. It's a little bit uh, more dangerous as far as crashing your plane and messing up. So, But check it out. You'll see that having a tank in the front with a full load of fuel is going to mess up your center of gravity. You'll have to put in some up trim usually going coming off the ground. If you don't, that's great. But you will notice the flight characteristics will start to change as the fuel gets uh, used up and the nose gets a little lighter. And coming in for a dead stick landing, if anything ever happens to a point where you have to come in for a dead stick landing, you're going to find that your trims are going to be messed up. Your plane might want to 
porpoise a little bit because of the lack of weight in the nose. So that's why I do that. It's just been a habit since my pattern days. And I'm going to basically do it with this. But it's going to be a little bit on the heavy side in the nose because of the four ounce tank in the nose. It's the only way I can get the right amount of fuel in here to make it work. All right. I'm going to set up these tanks. I'm sure you guys already know how to set up a fuel tank. Um, when you buy a Sullivan tank or a Dubro tank, whichever, these are Sullivans. On the package and the little tab shows you how to set it up and uh, just follow those directions. And uh, I suppose I'll set these tanks up and then I'll talk a little bit about, about the setup of the tank and we'll move on from there. Be back in a minute. I have my tanks installed. The six ounces here and the four ounces up front. I'll kind of show it to you. See it just kind of sits the line, let's see, right about here. You can see the little line on the on the saddle, that's center of gravity. It intersects the center of the tank. It's not mounted in there yet. I'm gonna velcro it down with a little foam rubber underneath, you know. Uh, what I did is I ran hard lines of aluminum from the tank around the header tank out the firewall. And the aluminum tubing I used is from k and I bought it at the local hobby shop. And uh, it cost five bucks, four ninety nine. Has a number on here of one zero zero one oh seven and underneath that it's uh, number fifty one oh two. And it comes with four of these. I think they're about 12 inch or so uh, aluminum tubing for the tank. I like these because they bend easy. You can form them around things. Um, I've never had one leak or break. And with the fuel tanks, they give you this little tiny piece of brass, okay? So it just goes barely inside the fuel tank, far enough that you can attach a tube in uh, your your flex tubing on it and it only goes this far so instead of running silicone tube out the front I decided it's better to run a hard line I always do when I do something like this is run a hard line all the way out prevent any kind of accidental leakage or anything like that and in the front you can see this is the the main line coming from the six ounce tank and it goes into the overflow of the four ounce and this goes to the carb right there this comes from the main tank it's the it's the carburetor pressure side and that goes to the muffler I just hung a tube on there to make it easier for you to see so that is done I just need to pack foam around them and uh, I'm gonna put two straps of velcro on the six ounce tank That'll secure that down and in the Velcro will be glued to the fuselage top. Um, and when they're sitting in there like that, uh, the, the caps of the fuel are pretty much parallel. So I get an even flow. It's not gonna, it's gonna try to uh, siphon out, but it's gonna be minimal, so it's not a big deal that's how I'm going to do the fuel tanks that I think that's about all that I, I can t tell you on the fuel tank it's pretty easy and you can see I still have room this will slide forward and back still but I have room right here for my throttle servo which is going to be positioned on this side which is gives me plenty of room and you can see that the tank moves so I can maneuver around it uh, let's see and then I need to install on the wing the airline servo and it has to clear these servos so that could be a little problem it, sometimes it is sometimes it's most of the time it's not but uh, that's that now where do we go from here I think I really don't need to worry about these tubes um, this one here let me explain this this loop right here uh, can you see that it comes from the main tank to 
to the exhaust side of the the header tank is is just a little loop. The reason for that, I was going to run a hard line and make a loop and and make it all hard a hard line, but uh, I decided that since my engine has to go on here and the the lines are behind the back plate I needed something flexible so when I push the motor back it will move away from the engine and and just kind of sit there it'll probably wear through eventually but I'm not too awfully worried about it um, it's very rare that I've ever had something wear through so and I can bend this and I still get good ventilation between the two tanks so that's the way that's gonna work and the engine will sit on here something like, I'll line it up with the holes, something like that. So everything's going to be where it's supposed to be. I thought it'd be good if I showed you what's happening inside the model. You could see the six ounce tank when I showed you the fuselage on the inside, but you couldn't see the header tank or the lines. So I'm going to kind of explain it again and uh, show you where everything is at. This is the firewall right there pressure line coming in goes to the six ounce tank puts pressure in the tank forces the fuel out through the little silicone fuel line loop to the overflow on the four ounce tank which is next to the firewall and then from there to the carburetor and the lines are bent similar to this on the inside of the plane uh, to feed it through I just drilled uh, little eighth inch holes it through the firewall and stuck a piece of music wire through the the firewall and into the hard lines and that that was a guide for my fuel my hard lines to come through the firewall and uh, that's an easy way to do it if you ever have a problem like that all right next step I think is running the throttle servo I'll just put a screw into the engine mount the throttle uh, cable through here just route it in and uh, that will be the end of that and primarily the fuselage will be done so give me a second I'm gonna grab a drill punch a hole through the firewall and get ready to mount the servo There's a hole for the throttle cable. And uh, what I did, how I got that uh, point to put it on, or to drill the hole, is I put the motor up and I lined it up and I used a piece of rod. Uh, let's see, this will work. And let me spin this around, I can show you a little better, but uh, I used a piece of rod and just lined up the hole straight back with the throttle arm not a big deal but I'll show you anyways just in case you haven't ever set up a nitro motor let's see here all right kind of difficult for me to see but I will do the best I can here what I do is I swing the throttle arm all the way back and all the way forward make sure it stays in a nice level straight line um, gonna end up dropping some stuff on the floor here but okay let me pinch this off and uh, throttle arm swinging it all the way back and the hole will line up all like this and you just run your rod straight back just like that you have to make sure that the where it goes through the firewall is higher than just a I don't know, maybe a thousandths or so higher than the arc of the swing of the throttle arm otherwise you won't get enough uh, movement off your throttle arm to go full throttle or low throttle just one of those things that you got to look out for um, not a big deal most people already know that but 
uh, for you who haven't set up a nitro motor, you have to remember that wherever the highest arc is on the swing of your throttle arm is where your throttle push rod should go through your firewall. Okay, take that off. I just need to make sure I got a clean shot and it goes all the way back right where I want it to. I'm not going to use a solid push rod. I'm going to use some golden rod cable. I like the golden rod cable because I have a little bit more flexibility of going around objects inside my fuselage even though I don't have anything in the way. Um, it's a good thing to do and I do have everything done inside. Let me show you. Point it out here. I put Velcro inside the, the compartment here. It's glued to the top of the fuselage and on top of that I tacked on a piece of foam rubber so it's sitting on foam strapped it down and on the side since it's around and since it is a round tank I put little triangular wedges on the bottom or actually on the top of the fuselage to cradle the tank in place so it's not going to move the tank won't move forward for um, well it won't move forward at all because of this brace that I have for my retract cable it will hit that and stop it from going back or going forward and to go back I'm probably going to just uh, put up some kind of a makeshift stopper right here that's something that I can remove I haven't figured out exactly what I'm going to do yet Let's see what else did I do uh, throttle servo I installed that next to my retract servo this is not the, the right setup I'm going to use I'm not going to use a an easy connector like this I'm going to use probably something a little different because it sticks up a little high and, I'll, and it's going to have to be underneath this rod right here so there's not much there's not a lot of room there to play around with so I might just go with a regular uh, clevis on that the mount itself for the servo is let me grab some of this it is a piece of, uh, I believe this is birch. It came in a great big chunk at uh, Home Depot and I bought it and uh, I cut a rail out uh, using my circular saw. You can use whatever you want really. It's not that hard of a, a wood but it, it beats plywood. And to brace it up I used a small chunk of light ply as little braces on on the sides to hold it up and on the edge of the fuselage on, on um, against the fuselage underneath the rail I'm just going to slide in a piece of triangular block I don't have any on the bench but uh, I'll glue that up inside to keep it from breaking loose and that's about it okay I'll grab the the golden cable here and we'll see how far we can go and I don't want to come out give me a second and uh, I'll get this out of the package got it out of the package here and uh, I'm gonna slide it through and let you see where it goes this is the first trial fit come on up around the tank there we go it's gonna have to be braced along the top here somewhere so it's going to run right along the edge of the fuselage and that keeps it out of the way of anything else that might happen to go down the center that's what I always do is try to keep things away from other things so it'll probably be braced let's see somewhere in this area here standoff uh, type piece of plywood or something all right, need to measure this out. Uh, I'm going to leave overhang on the front end just to make sure I have enough. So 
right there. And what I like doing is just taking a knife and just scoring it a little bit. You don't really need to cut it, just a light score. And just bend it and it'll break. Sometimes it'll break right off, but this time it looks like it's gonna be a little bit obstinate, not a problem. There we go. Don't need that. And the cable, we'll see where the alignment goes here. Slide this in, something like that. And the cable I have laying off to the side will go down into the golden rod housing. Here we go. And this will go up to this side of the throttle arm on the servo. I'll point it out to you here. It'll come over to here, this side of the arm, and it'll attach here. And what it attaches with, I'm sure you all know already, but I'll go over it. And if I can get them out of the package, I haven't done, haven't done that yet, so bear with me. Nothing ever goes as planned. <laughs> But I'll be using these solder on threaded rods. They'll, it'll solder on the end of the cable like that. And the clevis will screw onto there and that will attach to the servo arm. And the same with the front. I'll cut it off a chunk. And once the motor's on, I'll figure out how long the cable has to be. And then I'll do the same. So I'm going to do a quick solder job and put this on here. Back in a minute. I normally use a 400 watt soldering gun to do this, but I broke mine. <laughs> so I, all I'm left with is a propane torch. And I'm sure everybody has a propane torch, so you can relate to what I'm going to do. I have some solder and some resin. And uh, I basically jam the resin onto the end of this. I'm going to tin the cable first. Try not to use too much heat. That should be good enough. And uh, tap it off and get the excess off. And next, what I like doing, um, there's different ways of doing this. A lot of guys will put more solder on their cable and then heat up this, the, the threaded rod part, and then jam the cable in there and have an overflow. Myself, I like to put some solder inside, and I put a little rosin on there. Do a little, a little heat up here. And I usually pretty much fill it with solder. Okay, now I'll reheat it again and I'll put my cable down inside it. Okay, I'm gonna apply a little more heat, just a touch more solder. There we go, it's filled up nice. And it should be good to go. Grab it with a pair of pliers, because that sucker is probably pretty warm, I would, I would imagine. Cool it down. Wipe it off. And there you have it, right there. And then the clevis will screw on. There we go, like that. I'll install it into the plane and hook it to the servo and get my, my uh, throttle actuator arm in a position where I can make a general assumption on how long to cut this. So give me a second, I'll get things rearranged and I'll be right back. I have the servo set to full throttle, and I'm going to hold on to this so you can see. 
that's low full throttle full throttle full trim and what I did is I lined up my horn you can see the horn right here it's already attached just for measuring purposes and you might be able to see this mark right here that's my cutoff mark and you'll probably see another mark back here and that is for my cutoff pliers and uh, I have to slide it up the rod which I'm going to do right now or, or slide up the cable give me a second and I'll get it into view and I'm going to line it up with the far mark which is right there and snip it off just like that and it's just the right length to slide on to the arm here I'll get it so it'll go on this is already tinned so it might not slide on all the way oh but it does okay well it's not quite all the way what I need to do is get this soldered on and uh, that's going to take a little bit of work for me because I have to repair my soldering iron because I dropped it that's why I can't use it at the moment but um, give me about 30 minutes of my time blink of an eye for you to get that fixed and uh, I'll get this this thing soldered on and that'll be done you can hear that my soldering iron is about ready to give up the ghost hit the floor pretty pretty hard okay got the cable tinned and this piece I've already tinned so I'm going to get it ready to slide on I'm going to position my soldering iron here in a place where I can get to it get it to slide on keep feeding it solder. I got extra solder on the tip so it's feeding up inside when I start heating the lower end of the the chamber here kind of drawing it up inside that should do it let that cool and I'll be back the arm is on you can see it there I'll move the throttle for you so you can see it working low throttle full throttle it's full range full movement I should take a look inside the carb wide open and closed that's with the trim all the way down and with the trim up take about halfway you probably can't see it too well because of the angle it's kind of dark in there but you can see it's cracked open a little bit Full throttle closed and low throttle shut off all right that pretty much concludes the throttle except I want to show you one more thing just wanted to show you that I did brace this rod up and this is a piece of eighth inch light ply and if I rotate a little bit you can see that I braced that with some triangular sock and I did another one right there and it's also braced with triangular stock now on the throttle arm itself I had to cut one of the arms off I'm going to cut these other two off later but you don't need to see me do that it was binding with the with the clevis well that is just about it for this well that's as far as I can go for now uh, I feel like I'm getting a cold I'm getting a little bit of a rough voice so I'm gonna knock it off right here I'm pushing about an hour anyways on the video when I come back I believe I'm going to get the cowling on and uh, get that squared away or I could put the 
the servo on the wing, that would kind of help finish that off too. I'm kind of hodgepodging as I go here. But uh, I think the cowling would be more interesting than putting the servo on the wing. So we'll do the cowling and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. So until next time, y'all have a good one.